<clears throat> Hello YouTube family, YouTube uh, followers, fighting guru fans and MMA fans from all around the world. I'm happy to bring you another episode today to discuss UFC, a great card for a fighting perspective, I mean a fighting fan perspective, but this is one of the worst cards from a betting perspective. They've gotten you know, a full card that's from top to bottom. Almost every single one of these fights is in 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 them. You're going to notice that they're very close matchups. There's no fights where one guy will stand out to be the far more superior uh, martial artist or fighter than his opponent. You're going to notice all of them are very evenly matched. And there's no fight where one of them would win 10 out of 10 times. There's Most of them are typically around the 60 at best 70, 30 percentile. And that, for a guy who likes to do parlays, for a guy who's known to make a lot of parlays, and that's where mo more of my profits come from. Now, don't get me wrong. I do the other bets. I do prop bets. I give away single bets. Off my single, the way my system is designed, just off of our single bets and prop bets, we make all our total money back. And then when parlays cash in, that's just profits. So first I make our money back. I make sure that you get all your money back from the total amount using only safe bets. One of my columns on my bet slips, I give out columns A, B, and C, is always designed to be safest bets possible to get us insured to make sure that whatever happens to the parlays, because parlays can be tricky, that we're going to profit at least something. Then when you see that we had like last weekend days where all that a lot of all the single bets almost cashed in, almost every single one of them with the exception of two. So we did that, we insured our money, we made our profits so that if every other bet in column B and C, let's say, none of those parlays cashed in, we would not walk away without some profit. But luckily for us, the profits were even bigger when we counted our total profits in each column. One of the columns alone brought us four times our money back. One of the columns that was designated for 50% of our our total bankroll was happening happened to be the column that generated the highest profits. I was doing only four leg, three legs, so majority of them were plus 300 odds. There wasn't one single bet in my parlays, and I had about uh, a lot of variations where not one of them was not plus money. So we made a killing. It was one of those nights where. You multiplied your money by four times or more, depending on how how much you used and which bets. Because I gave, I gave them um, more than more than just the bet slips. I added extra bets afterward, like during the event, right before it started. I added some extra parlays, like a bonus section that's optional for the customers that wanted to take it a few more parlays out at the last minute with those parlays. We cashed in uh, plus 800 odds parlay. So now just the extra added plays, we hit a huge profit. We are in the greens like a, uh, almost 300% return of investment without including the single bets. That's just off the parlays. So uh, this week is not going to be that type of a week where we're going to go parlay crazy. Last week we were able to do that. Next week we'll be able to do that as well. The 17th card is perfect for that. So 8 or 9 out of 10 times, the system with parlays majority only, mainly parlays, will always work. But there will be these exceptions to the rule. And it's probably because it's a Conor McGregor fight, pay-per-view. They don't want to give you... Um, so many fights that are not going to be interesting. That's not going to keep you uh, like at the edge of your seat, wondering, "Oh man, he's winning now." But no, the other guy's winning now. They want exciting, interesting, uh, unexpected uh, type of fights where you're going to be drawn to it because it's a big event. Conor McGregor cards is red panties night for everybody on that card. 
They get way more, uh, a lot more attention and views. It's their biggest event of the year. If Conor doesn't fight again, there will be no other event bigger than this one. So they make sure they put fights that are going to be competitive. And that's not good for us. But to me, it's clear as night and day. I, whatever I tell you to, to do as far as who to pick, it's going to no, win, lose, or draw. It's the right move. It's the smarter bet. And I don't base my decision on odds, who's too big of a favorite, value, because you want to win. Value, if it's not as good as it should be, and you're paying a bigger price tag, it's most likely going to be because that's the guy who's going to win. So you just let them keep, it's better to cut out, cut out of your profits than to just take all your money and not give you anything. So why bet on the guy who's, you know, not supposed to be that big of a favorite if you're just not going to get nothing back? You're going to more likely than not, it gets to the point where that guy loses so much, chasing value makes you lose so much that, that when that freak accident, that two out of 10 times, if you're lucky, happens, it, you're just winning back some of your money that you lost. You'll never be in profits. It'll always just be you chasing back after money. Where on my my system, it makes sure you're on the other end. You're winning eight out of 10 times. So, uh, so yeah, that system is a lot more in the long run, beneficial and short term. So you can expect not to have to wait a year to start to see profits. You wanna live like it's an actual extra source of income. You can depend on betting to pay your bills. Join my Patreon. You're going to be substituting your income with you use my system. You have to do it exactly how I say. Bet for bet. Instructions especially are very important. If I tell you this section needs 60% of your money, don't go throw 30%. That can that alone will change the entire um spectrum of where you're going to be at in profits. The way I design it with the percentages to tell you how much to put on each bet is systematically designed out of genius. Like I had to specifically say that based off risk, rewards, likelihood, that's how much we're basing our money. So the higher risks, they get the column with the higher risk bets that may not cash in, we'll get the smaller. It makes up because we'll give them the smaller percentage of our money. But because the payouts are so much better, you end up getting the same amount of profit from that tiny uh, portion of your money as you would get from the bigger portion. So that's why it's a genius system. If I, I can talk all day about how I perfected it, but you don't have to know about how I designed it. If you're in the Patreon, just duplicate it, follow the steps. It's as easy as that. You don't have to, I'm the brain and muscle. You just take advantage of the, of all the work I'm doing in your, for you. So you don't have to do it or in your behalf. Okay. Today's fight is a uh, breakdown is off the UFC 264 card. We're going to talk about, um, uh, this was highly requested. What's, uh, uh I mean, uh, Stephen Thompson versus uh, Stephen Thompson versus Gilbert Doreno Burns. Uh, this is a guy who has for the longest time, I mean, St Tyrone, I mean, uh, sorry, Stephen Thompson may go down as one of the best ever, top two, top three um, guys who were the best fighters in UFC that never became champions. This guy's on the top of that list, somewhere in the top two, top three at least, if not number one. He's got a 57-0 undefeated kickboxing record. Very impressive, but we'll talk about that a little bit later because there is a downfall about that. There's, this, there's a disadvantage that comes with that long experience in kickboxing, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. So, you know, uh, I'm going to compare the advantages. The reason why I say my picks are always win, lose, or draw the smarter bet because I'm going to give you the pick for the guy who's got the more paths to victory, the more likelihood and chance of winning and in more than just one way. So they were not going to be someone who's 
who's one-dimensional or like a one-trick pony who needs to put all his eggs in one basket, that's not who I'm going to give you to win. Unless the guy's a complete fade he's going up against, it'd have to be like a huge fade. I will not give you the guy who's limited to just one one uh, way of winning when his opponent has four or five different methods of winning and um, is capable of doing it in either one of them because that tells us if push comes to shove and the defense is not allowing him to take this path he can just focus on another path that's because usually that's what happens when somebody is studying you they give you six months six weeks three weeks sometimes to prepare for your opponent you'll notice that a lot of the time you'll see a guy walking with a complete different game plan looking like a complete different fighter because he's adjusted his style his game plan according to how to be able to nullify his opponent's strong suit or his threats. Mm -hmm. So if a guy's a good submission artist, or, but he uses his wrestling, he needs to wrestle with you to get, to get the win. He's got to take it to the ground. You'll notice they fight with the low guard, which is a perfect example. You're Stephen Thompson. You'll notice in all of his fights. He keeps his hands all the way down. He doesn't have your boxing stance. He doesn't have that type of a guard. In this fight, that's genius. That's the best stance you can have. Besides, like, uh, there's another stance you can use as well, but he, he's not, he's not uh, accustomed to that, so it makes no sense for him to do it that way. But this is just as good because here's what's going to happen. Every... Now, mind you that uh, Stephen Thompson's got a huge reach advantage. And the only times he's ever lost to anybody in his career, in, in, in the UFC especially, because that's the first time he tasted defeat, it wasn't against a guy who was a jiu-jitsu specialist, who was a good, even a point fighter. Vincente Luque is probably the second best point fighter in the UFC. So, in that division especially. He's the only guy that's close to just... He's not to to actually getting besides the champ. The champ is also a pretty good, but he did, he gets a lot, he he's typically not looking to win by decision. So I don't consider him like a point fighter. He kind of sets he starts off that way, but then he turns into a headhunter or a finisher. But I'm talking about just strictly guys who want to point fight the entire time. Vincente Luque is close to probably the second best next to Stephen Woodley. I mean, Stephen Thompson. So if he had no luck, if he got dominated from bell to bell, pillar to post, start to finish. And mind you, uh, D Gilbert Burns was on his corner during that fight. He was cornering um, his his friend, his training partner, uh, his fellow Brazilian um, brother, um What's his name? Jeez. I just said it. Um, you know who I'm talking about. The guy I just talked about uh, fighting as Vincente Luque. He is... Uh, Gilbert Burns was cornering him during that fight. He was there watching, strategizing, and that says a lot. The fact that with Vincente Luque's... More of a well-rounded fighter than Gilbert Burns. Vincente Luque is good on the ground, he's good, but he's way better on the feet. He knows how to mix it up what, more better with kicks and you know just combinations and movement. He's the better fighter out of the two if you're comparing him to Gilbert Burns. So if Vincente Luque struggled, um, and see the thing is with what confused me about uh, Vince, the strategy he used against Stephen Thompson. It was all bad strategy. It's not that Vincente Luque wasn't a better fighter or couldn't win. He went with the worst possible game plan in the world. There's literally no other game plan that could have been worse than the one that he used. And the funny thing is, when he couldn't find success doing that, he kept coming back into the next round. Second round started. He kept doing the same thing. Third round started. He didn't change his game plan from the from the start to the finish, even knowing he was losing the rounds. And so for Gilbert Burns to say, you know, to use that as a bragging right, I was on his corner. You guys should be ashamed of yourselves. He has it in it. It's not that Vincente Luque didn't have the tools. He didn't have the skill sets. He had them. He has them. How did he fight Woodley when Woodley heard him on the ground. He did he closed the distance 
in that a sense of striking distance. He closed it as in putting him in a clinch, backing him up against the cage, making it a dirty fight, making it so that he's not going to be able to move around and use his bouncing uh, karate stance and movement. He, he negated the power shots of Woodley by stuffing him, by getting it, making it close inside of a clinch or against a cage. He, he, he smothered him. And that's the only way you can beat a guy like Woodley. Not one time did Jeff Neal do that. Not one time did Vincente Luque do that. Jeff Neal, as a matter of fact, there was a moment in the fight where if Woodley fell to the ground, he was like a sitting duck waiting to be finished. He was on the ground for like five, ten seconds. Neil backed off so he can get up. You, he treated Thompson as if he was like some fifth degree black belt, coral belt, BJJ specialist, Royce Gracie submission artist. That's the way he treated Thompson when he fell on the ground. So a lot of times Thompson has been looking good lately due to the the wrong doings of his opponents. He looks better, just like we've seen Gilbert Burns look great against Woodley because Woodley was gun shy. He was not the same Woodley of old. So everybody was going crazy and super high on Gilbert, so high that they thought he was going to be better than the current champ, who's got like a seven inch reach advantage. Who's, if you looked at my breakdown video for the Usman versus um Gilbert Burns breakdown prediction video I have on YouTube still there you'll notice before the fight I told you guys the jab is what's going to hurt and it's going to cost him 90% of my breakdown was talking about the jab nobody even associated anything with jab and and um and Usman before before uh, he won that fight, except for me. I was just going on about how his jab is the reason why he was able to beat Kobe Covington. His jab is what gets him out of trouble and not allows him to, especially with that reach. And now Gilbert Burns is going against a guy who's got the same type of a reach advantage as um, as uh, Usman. So he's going to pose the same trouble. But that thing that got Usman caught is his... He doesn't move in angles. He doesn't create angles to defend himself while still being offensive. It's a beautiful thing. When you have that movement, even if you're not a karate guy, you should... You should... Um, you should in imitate the same type of movement that Stephen Thompson uses because that keeps for many reasons, not just to move yourself out of harm ways, but it creates openings for your next offensive maneuvers or weapons. So it gives you better uh, opportunities to land cleaner, better shots while keeping you out of harm's way. If, as long as you're angling, you're stepping outside of the lead foot, whatever they are, if they're southpaw, you're going southpaw, you're going the other that way or this way. Uh, if they're orchid, the orthodox, you go the opposite way. But as long as you're going the right way and you're nonstop moving, that, and that's how you'll notice he's always he's like a little uh, frog. He's he's bouncing so he can make that what that does for him. That other fighters that don't do that, it doesn't do. The reason why Usman got caught is because he was stationary. He was um, planted heavy on his feet. And you don't have the ability to use cat-like reflexes. That's why Gil Gilbert Burns' as absorption rate versus his landing rate are very close. They're neck and neck. Five or five to five or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. Very close. So, uh, but, what, but Thompson, he doubles. So he's somewhere like around two or, or three, and he's closer to five instead uh, of being as being um, someone who gets hit as much as he hits them. He's he's capable of being able to evade the shots because of his movement. So um, that's why you notice the other guy who beat him. What, you know what his game plan was? And mind you, Darren Till, who's the only other guy who's got a win over him besides Tyrone Woodley, but that's not the same Tyrone Woodley. This was when he was considered the best welterweight of all time. They were comparing him to GSPs, and that's a different. And he still held a good account of himself. He went to draw, 
and the second fight was amazing. It was just as good as the first fight. I think he even should have deserved a second draw. That's how good. I mean, it was. I think no, I take that back. Slightly, just a little bit. Did uh, Woodley pull through with that? He did better than the first fight because he was more used to. He had enough time to go back and fix the mistakes, and uh, he fought against the guy who had the same, who was the same guy. The only difference in the second fight was Woodley made adjustments and improvements, and Thompson didn't. He he fought the same way he fought in the previous fight, so he didn't have as much success. But that's the thing. A guy like that. Now let's go back to what I told you I was going to go back to. 57-0 and 0 in kickboxing. Bravo. Very good for you. That's great. But do you know what a lot of kickboxers have? A, even Israel Adesanya has a huge bad habit that he does in almost all of his fights. He even did it in his recent win in, uh, against, I'm not recent, recent, but against his uh, Paulo Costa fight, but po Costa was frozen. He didn't capitalize on it, which was really weird because that's the area that Costa is usually the, uh, a killer. That's how he finishes most of his fights with when he backs his opponents up against the cage and then blocks them off and just barrage of flurry of crazy big shots he did that to Adesanya at one point but he froze he didn't do he didn't go for the kill like he usually does but the reason he was able to do that to Adesanya and the reason we saw uh even Pettis did it many times to him and but he he didn't he won he he didn't win because of that I mean he landed some shots because of it but you'll notice that Stephen Thompson sometimes he backs himself against a cage because uh, he feels safe. There's a sense of security. They have that ropey dope thing, like where when you're a kickboxer, you can depend on. There's no cage. It's a. It's like a, a catapult. It's like it gives you. It's a spring where you can use it to evade punches. So when somebody closes the distance, unless you're in a corner, that's why they say you get out the corner. Get out. You'll hear coaches. The worst place to be in a boxing ring is on the, against a corner because that doesn't have a spring. And so it gives you the false sense of urge, uh, comfort and safety of I'm safe here because that's they're just so used to when you're fighting, you're not thinking five steps ahead. You're reacting, your judgment, your decision making is from reflexes and instincts. Instincts is if you that's why it's got to be repetitive. You got to if you want to be good at something, you got to train to do it so so many times over and over and over until it becomes natural for you to do it as a reflex. Well, reflexes and natural um, behavior and response to when somebody's trying to back them up and uh, cut them off and back them up again and go just uh, pressure him is. Go against if I if he's not going to stop pressuring me and he's not going to keep cutting me off. If if he's going to continue to keep cutting me off, at least I have a chance against the uh, cage or against the ropes where it'll not allow him to come forward with me while I'm being saved by the. So that's a that ropey dope thing is very common amongst kickboxers, and so but when they transition to MMA, it doesn't dawn on them while they're in the middle of a fight and they're not using that part of their brain that's thinking long term. They're just thinking, what do I do now? What do I do now? And therefore, the second, third thought behind, let me move back, doesn't ever happen. So it becomes a mistake, a hole in his game that he can probably never fix because of how long of a career he had, how many fights he had, how many times he used to use that defensive tactic. So that's going to be a dangerous spot. If And Dorino is a guy who knows whether he's like this or not. He's going to know that he has no other way if it's besides being on the ground. And he's not a wrestler. Dorino is a, a very highly credentialed BJJ specialist. So he's got some of the best BJJ in the game. But he's not a big wrestler. He's got terrible. He's got 30% takedown accuracy against the guy who's at almost 80% takedown defense. But even... Even uh, besides that, I don't expect him to be able to close the distance and get close enough to shoot in because would I mean um, Thompson is in his own right a counter striker, which is also what Dorino is. He's a he's the guy who kind of usually just waits for you to swing before he level changes and shoots in for takedowns or gives you a counter strike. So for whatever whether it's to set up a takedown. 
or he doesn't create his own openings. He doesn't put himself in harm's way. He tries to wait for the right moment and the opening. And at the highest level, that'll work on the lower levels. That'll work on the regional scenes. That works all the time for guys who do it against low tiers. But when you're at the higher levels, when you're against a guy who's this this high level, fifth degree black belt, He's not going to give you openings. He's not going to give you mistakes. And if he does, it's one in a blue moon. It's not going to be enough to get you the win. And every moment of the fight besides that, just that moment, will be him winning. So in a three-round fight, you can't afford to wait for mistakes. You can't afford to wait for a counter. you got to have a high-degree pedigree. Instead of getting third-degree Ju- uh, ju- bl- uh, black belts in jujitsu. He should have focused time on wrestling. He needs to make his arsenal good everywhere before he makes himself great at anything. That's the mistake that Gilbert made. And fighting in a weight class that's not his natural weight class, he was knocked out in the lower weight class by a guy like Hooker because of the reach. He doesn't fare well against guys who got big reach advantages. And another problem besides the reach advantage, which Hooker and uh, is very similar to the body style, length, and reach of um, of Thompson. But the other, the other thing that poses a threat is the speed. He's going to be seen. He's going to, another reason why I imagine he didn't want to stay at the lower weight class and he moved up to welterweight is because the speed. He's not a fast guy. He's not a, he's not able to, he doesn't have the greatest fluidity. He's the kind, he's the kind of, you'll see him gliding and like planted heavy on the foot because he wants to throw power punches. He's looking for a power punch knockout. He's not looking to win by, so anytime a guy's, his, now he's limited to two. He's a two-trick pony. He can only, by overextending, because he's not a good boxer either, unfortunately. Even though that's what he looks for, that's what he wants. He's not a fluid. He, when he's looking for a knockout, he's overextending himself the majority of the time and causing himself to lose balance, be sloppy. Anytime you do that kind of a throw, when you're throwing strikes way too wide and you know uh, overextending, you're not using precision. You're just wild. That wide, like the nickname, Demir Hadzovic, he got his nickname uh, Siberian Bomber or something like that because he's known and the people in his gym gave him that nickname as the Bomber because he just throws wings and overextends himself. He throws crazy shots just hoping that they land and hit his... Pedro Munez does that a lot. A lot of fighters do that because they're MMA guys or they're BJJ guys or they're Taekwondo guys. Very rare few people are just natural good boxers. So if you're a knockout artist... But I suggest you heavily invest in learning and training boxing. You cannot have as much success. Or if you're a BJJ specialist, I highly recommend and suggest you invest heavily on wrestling training. And I just don't see that. I don't see him improved on his wrestling. It, like uh, he was having trouble taking down Woodley. And but don't get me wrong, Woodley actually had like a ninety percent takedown defense. Uh, percentage so at that time and that, but that was uh, mostly from when he had fights against strikers or not Woodley's a great wrestler in his own right so not many people are looking to take him down so that's a part of the reason but the other part is he's a good credentialed wrestler he, he practiced and he trained wrestling for the majority of his life and career so that's a different situation but that's a uh, <clears throat> Another issue, the speed, the un- inability to use good wrestling. To, that's why you saw him go on his back and desperately try to almost beg Usman to go into his guard. He didn't set up a takedown. He just laid on his back and pulled guard, hoping that Usman would some reason, for some reason fall into that. Uh, but he didn't. He was smarter. He, he made the referee stand him back up. He even shot some good ink because he doesn't do many ankle picks. You'll notice that the submissions he usually does are almost all the same. He does like either an arm bar or a rear naked choke. He doesn't do any other fancy like ankle locks or, you know, calf slices. He doesn't do nothing crazy. He's just pretty basic submission specialist. Now, he could, I'm sure, but he's just not his style. He doesn't try to over, you know, perform. He just wants to get a submission. And so that's why 
unlike if you were fighting a Ryan Hall, you're, that he was able to give him a lot of kicks from the top. So he showed Burns that, hey, if you don't want to get up, I'll keep racking up these sco these points. He kept kicking him, kicking him, kicking him until he eventually got back up on his own. But, uh, you know, that's just because Usman knew him. They were training partners for so long. He knows where he's in danger against um, against Gilbert and where he's not in danger. So anyway, uh, for too many reasons, the, the volume, the fact that he's going to mix it up between many kicks and... Um, uh, strikes and although he doesn't throw many combinations which is good I think we can see probably we'll see the same same results in the same type of uh, volume and output as we've seen in his most recent win against Jeff Neal he'll, he'll, he should be able to, dupli to uh, duplicate the same type of a performance this should be no different but Again, if we see a different game plan, you you you, can't, you gotta pay attention. This may be a fight just because his chin isn't like the Sir the Pettis fight where he lost. He was winning that fight, and the whole fight he was winning it until that moment he got caught right on the chin, and it wasn't like a very big punch. It wasn't like a hook. It was a it looked like a jab, like a power jab, push jab. It wasn't a huge, but it connected right on his chin. That's the perfect spot. And he even catapulted himself off the cage, I think, if I remember correctly. Pettis, uh, so he used a little bit of velocity from the cage. Maybe that helped, but it didn't look like a big hit. So that shows that I don't think, and I'm almost sure, Gilbert Burns is a harder striker, a bigger, harder puncher than uh, Pettis. But Pettis is a more better precision striker, so it kind of evens out. But... Um, we got to see, and also Pettis was not as short, and he had he didn't have that big of a reach. He wasn't at a big of a, that big of a reach disadvantage. So uh, Gilbert Burns, he is way shorter, way smaller, way slower. And if you want to protect yourself just in case, I just don't see it happening. I don't see it unless unless that one thing I told you about. If you get some backed up against the cage, if you start to notice it's happening more than once or twice, you may consider wanting to hedge off and live betting, which is okay because you look. If you want a live bet, if you uh, want to hedge, don't lock in the bet now. Wait till after the first round because in the first round almost 0% chance he's going to knock out uh, Stephen Thompson. Because in the first round, he's going to be dry. Nothing's going to slip. Uh, I mean, uh, he's going to be dry. He's not going to be slipping on the floor. He's not going to be uh, falling. And he's not going to be, uh, what's the word, uh, fatigued or gazing out. So he'll be super quick. He'll be fresh. He'll, he'll have good reflexes and movement so it's going to be almost impossible to knock him out in the first round and i should see him being the point fighter the better point fighter of the two the one with the longer legs longer hands you can almost be positive sure 100 percent that he's going to be a bigger favorite starting after the first round starting the second round going into the second round burns will probably be a huge underdog so if you want to hedge just in case, maybe uh, wait until the second round and then put a little bit of money on um, Burns as an underdog, big underdog. Or you can use a prop bet by Burns by TKO. Should be paying pretty good plus money. And all that would do is if he doesn't get the knockout, take a small portion out of your profits from Thompson winning. So I'm a master at that. I'm a master at hedging in a sense where you win-win. It's a win-win situation. When one or two of the likelihood outcomes um, were to come to fruition. So uh, if, you're in the, if you're in the Patreon, once again, don't worry. I'll do that for us. Just copy everything I do. If there's a fight that I know there's a good chance it can go this way or that way, it's 60-40, 70-30. I'll put it in a super safe parlay with like my two most confident picks. And then with that prop bet, and you'll notice that I'll get you like a plus 800, plus 1500 odds uh, hedge. 
So it'll be not your normal hedge. It'll be the kind of hedge that no matter which outcome were to come to fruition, you're going to still make big profits. That's my specialty amongst many other ones that you've seen I have. Um, you know, I helped my patrons recently. We've been on a freaking uh, huge winning streak spree every day. It's been something where yesterday was NHL. We went 100%. We got outside five-star play cashed in. Then, uh, oh, and then MLB, we got uh, the Giants, Giants at minus 190 uh, money line and a parlay piece. So throughout the middle of the week, I give them like baseball, basketball, football, soccer plays. So only my most confident. I don't give them like seven plays. I pick my best two or three and I use them as a five-star play. And if you look at my accuracy, my success rate, I'm like in the upper 90, 85 to 95 percentile. In NHL, I'm near perfect. I'm like 98 percentile. I don't think I've gotten more than one or two wrong ever, if that even. I may even be a perfect at NHL. I hardly, I think I've only got one wrong in NHL. So I'm really good at picking because I only pick my most confident. I don't give them the whole thing. So I'd rather them invest all their money because it's different than MMA. MMA, you can't put all your eggs in one basket because anything can happen in a fight. But outside MMA bets, I treat them differently. I, I make um, them do it in a different way, and it's been paying off in a huge way. We make probably just as much, if not more money, on the outside MMA bets that I give them. You know, So um, that helps them when they're ready to bet on the fights. They're using profits from the middle of the week from other sports and i also i have a folder and i use a hashtag that says safest or safe parlay piece so when i give them like a uh, giant like that giants game yesterday minus 190 i told them this is a parlay piece so that they can lock it in with like you know a, a confident play of the uh, a fight that or stephen thompson with the Giants, so I always find a way to maximize the value for everything I'm doing. And that's why I'm, when I made 40 bets, and remember, they're small. I'm not giving them like 12 leg parlays 40 times. I'm giving them single bets, two leg parlays, three leg parlays. And the, the reason uh, that none of those parlays, not even one single parlay, including the two leg parlays, were minus money all of them were plus 300 on average plus 300 or higher including up to plus 900 almost so uh I, you know i i use uh also combining i have a lot of things that I, I don't need to get into but if you're uh in the patreon you have questions or if you're wanting to join the patreon and you want to have uh you had some questions before joining feel free to shoot me a message on my uh twitter if fighting it's all in the descriptions in my info so you can just ask me from the description uh from the social media accounts from instagram i have facebook and twitter either one of those you can use uh to contact me with any questions or leave it in a comment section if you have a question in the comment section i'll respond right back to you okay thank you guys you got my pick in a lot of different senses the one who has the more advantages, and I don't mean just physically with the reach and all, but I mean in the tools, in, in the movement, in the reflexes, and just every way. There's more paths to victory. There's more um, likelihood and more advantages in the side of Stephen Thompson. But I also gave you a method of hedging in a sense where no matter who wins, you can make the profits no matter what. But it's not that strong. I mean, you got to remember, Stephen Thompson took some big shots by Jeff Neal. He looked battered and bruised. His face was all messed up. So it's not that he's he's not durable. He's not like, he's not like a Julian Arosa. But against a precision striker who's got the same length as him, like Darren Till, was equal to his reach. He was able to beat him because of two things. He had a he had his hand cocked back, ready to go. His left, he's like the 
He's known for his power punches and one punch knockout power. His left is known to be one of the best left hands in his division. Even Jorge Masvidal in an interview said he was the hardest hitter and than, than anybody he's ever fought against. He said Masvidal, I mean Masvidal uh, admitted that uh, and so I assume that you know Stephen Thompson was aware and he must have felt the power and that kept them hesitant. It was the first time we seen some in the UFC somebody out point and he and uh, he wasn't head hunting. It's similar to like what Khabib does with his takedowns he, or what Brian Ortega does with his takedowns against Korean Zombie. He kept threatening to take him down like pretending same thing Dil Till was doing he was pretending like he had a big left waiting for him and was going to counter so that scared Thompson into not throwing anything big and just mostly waiting for him to you know open throw like a naked leg kick or he was mostly only countering kicks but that's the other good thing that Darren Till did I don't see uh, anybody else doing and that's why they don't have much success that's why his record is so good till today he wins a lot because nobody eats he's got a karate stance look what Dustin Poirier did to Conor McGregor because he uses that stance he finished him early in the second round um, because he chewed his legs from the start of the fight he was aiming to destroy his leg because why not? The guy's you. He's bringing it closer to you than he's he's closer to you than you're closer to him. So you'll always be able to beat him to the punch, and you'll have a way to stack up points while disrupting his lead leg um, movement. I mean, his movement that he depends on using his lead leg to generate the power and to uh, have a way to throw the strikes with enough force it's all real and also set it up by movements to to um to um what's the word i'm looking for uh to mask what what you're doing what you're gonna do in order to f deceive them and throw strikes it's gonna require you to use your movement with your lead foot to like barcelos does that a lot he tricks people by using his footwork to make them think he's going in from one spot but then he'll end up using a different angle instead so eating up the lead foot is gonna cause a lot of offensive um issues for the fighter and defensive he won't be as good on the defense and it's going to more also act as a good defense mechanism for you the person giving the kicks now it's almost like you're, it's the equivalent to what a jab would do is keep your di uh, opponent at a distance and you from harm's safe from harm's way so um Darren Till if you watch that fight the first thing what gave him so much success in the later rounds was two things. Not just that he showed him that his left, he kept in trying to intimidate him with his left power punch. That's his uh, punch he uses to knock people out with. But also the leg kicks. He invested in them very early on. And he made, like if you look at Thompson's legs, there was an area about this big purple blue red yellow all discolored you can tell that was a lot and he's not a good he's not a big like he can do switch stance but he's not as effective in his other stance that that stance is typically more for being defensive than offensive uh jiri is like that as well when you notice when jiri switches his stance it's not to be offensive with it it's typically to be able to um be able to block and move out the way of whatever offense your opponent is throwing okay uh so let me see i covered everything i gave you the reasons i gave you uh the the smart pick win loser draw the one who's more likely to be able to either uh because karate you know one of the things about karate fighters i like a lot and it works in MMA. You'll notice when Doreen, when um, it's not bad enough that he's slow. Gilbert Burns is not very fast. He's slow and he doesn't have the footwork and the boxing skills to cover and mask what his th punches are going to be coming from. Or So he's very predictable because he's not a great boxer. He doesn't throw very good feints. He tries. Like you can see him trying, but it's not very, it's not very good. It's not a it's not like a, it's like having a bad poker face. People can just tell 
and you can tell so you can predict his punches uh, pretty easily if you're at a high level of a, a striking like uh, Thompson is but the other advantage is in karate and I did karate for two years not long but the thing that they make you do repetitive that they teach you the first thing and like day one one of the most basic things is to punch like this all your punches are straight so it becomes natural that he goes straight down the pipe and anytime you that's how Gil Gilbert got knocked out by Burns straight punch straight nothing hook nothing crazy not he 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 hit him with precision using and when you're hitting when you're hitting a, a person through a straight punch you're not just you're not using power generated from your arm only you're using your chest your shoulders your hips so it becomes uh, it, it becomes more more uh, devastating than uh, your typical punch when it's loopy like Gilbert Burns unless he, like the only time he had a, he had success in fighting against somebody with strikes is when they threw caution to the wind and try to like street brawl with them and just make it a you know a, all f like a crazy brawl that's when he's had success or against like guys who are just low level who cover up who are very old chinny Damian Maya shouldn't be fighting anymore the guy's worn his chin is worn out so he's he's not a you know a guy you can give burns too much credit for and all those other guys uh nobody high level like the closest he's ever gone to fighting you know somebody at the higher level tier dan hooker and that was even a smaller weight class and he got knocked out um woodley even when he was showing small signs he had a lot of trouble he didn't he didn't have a lot, but he had more trouble fighting Woodley and beating Woodley than Usman did because Usman had the size that he's naturally a big guy even for that weight class where Burns was at a disadvantage even in the lower classes. That's why he couldn't reach Hooker safely without getting touched first. So Thompson's going to do the same thing Hooker did, but Thompson's got better movement. He's got He creates angles better than anybody else. He moves, he's non-stop like a bunny. Energizer bunny is the perfect um, he, the perfect metaphor or analogy I can use. The guy's continuing to hop around all day, uh, the entire, you'll never see him stuck or planted. So that's hard to knock out a guy like that. It took, it took Pettis having to do a Superman punch off the cage, his like showtime move. His Benson Henderson, but with a punch instead of a kick, he did the same thing. It took one of those types of crazy, like never seen before, once in a million uh, types of, you know, once in a blue moon. Have you ever seen anybody do that type of stuff? It took something like that unexpected, that uh, unpredictable to knock Wood Thompson out. So that's not the type of a dynamic, uh, explosive uh, striker that uh, Burns is. Uh, he made the mistake of investing too much time in his BJJ and not learning the other trades that are more important even, I would say, because every fight starts on the feet. So even if he gets lucky in one round and finds a way to take Steven Thompson down, a guy who's got one of the highest straight takedown defenses in the game, it doesn't necessarily mean he's going to win the fight. Like, if you look at all the submission wins that he got, besides maybe Alex Oliveira, that was a pretty impressive submission because Oliveira was doing a lot of stuff correctly until that one small mistake, and that was it. And that's all you need to do is that mistake. But again, at this level, Oliveira is not at that level. Oliveira, although, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Burns was the first pers person to ever finish Oliveira inside the distance. But since then, we've seen many people do it. I mean, not many, but we've seen few people do it. So, again, another one that you can't put too much. But that was on the ground with a submission and after a few uh, failed attempts. But the other ones in his earlier stages of his career, cans. Like guys you'd, you'd never even heard of. Just all has-beens or never-was type of fighters. So I can't give him too much credit. I need him to beat people at the higher level consistent. I need him to look good doing it before I can bet on him against a guy like Thompson. Thompson's a guy who has how many title uh, shots? How many times has he challenged for the title? How long? How many times has he been the number one guy in his, you know, 
a guy with that type of credentials, with that type of experience against high level, he's going to have tricks under his sleeves. He's going to be the one with more crafty, better fight IQ, better ring generalship. He'll know how to make it his fight. He'll dictate where and how the fight is going to be going. And um, that's just too much, man. That's uh, That's... Not uh, in the past, in the history, we've seen against Vincente Luque, for example, who's a better version, in my opinion, better mixed martial artist when it comes to mixed martial arts and overall fighting. Vincente Luque is a, a better fighter than Gilbert. Like, let's pretend this was a video game, a PlayStation remote. It has A, B, C, D. Every one of those buttons that you press, Stephen Thompson will do something different. He's got more weapons. Where Gilbert Burns, if you pick him in a video game, he's got like two buttons you can use. The rest of the buttons will just keep doing the same thing. He's got the same moves. So somebody who's limited to what type of moves he can use is not going to probably be the guy who can land more and look better in the judge's eyes. When they tally it all up, ooh, 30 kicks. Uh, four takedown uh, attempts stuffed. A uh, hundred something total strikes. Like it's going to become impossible to keep up with somebody because you cannot defend. He doesn't have the reflexes. He he's not light on his feet to be able to maneuver out the way as much as uh, Thompson. Which is why, if you look on his record, he's putting twice as much landing per minute. He's putting twice as much strikes out that land then he's absorbing and as opposed to Gilbert who has to take a shot to give a shot and at the highest level that you can't do that that that's that's not going to cut it so even if he ever found a way to win the belt and be the champion very quickly he he would lose that belt after one or two title defenses until he can fix that until he can compete with the best boxers and look like a boxer move like a boxer Fight like a wrestler when he needs to. You got to have it all. That's the new evolved MMA world we're in. The Tito Ortiz's or the Chuck Liddell's, the Matt Hughes. Those guys are extinct for a reason. That the style is not one-dimensional. You got to the champions. All the guys who hold the belt now have. Look at Volkanovski. His interviews. He's like, I I wish somebody would take me down to see how good I am on the ground. He invites it. He wants people to tr to test his ground game, but he wins all his fights on the feet. So that's that's the type of evolved game that you have to have if you want to beat the top tier guys or fight against the top three, top five guys. So Gilbert Burns was kind of lucky. He fought. The reason why he's so high in the rankings, he fought. He was one of the first people to expose and find out that Woodley has not been the same guy for a long time. So. Uh, he was the first because Woodley was the favorite. He was a minus 160 favorite. So he's the first guy that was lucky enough to fight the washed up Woodley. So for a, a long time, we had this image of like, wow, he's so good. He did something that nobody else has ever done. He dominated Burns. But then we saw like, uh, or I think he made, yeah, he was, no, I apologize. He was the second person, second person. Before that, that was uh, Usman had already done it. I apologize. But uh, one of the top, so, but we thought Usman was just that good because he's a guy who was undefeated and he was doing that same thing to everybody else before doing it to Woodley. So that's why I meant, that's what I thought, that's why I thought that he was, well, so I was right in the sense he was the first one that got credit for being a beast by doing it to somebody who was still a favorite at that time. So he was the favorite, Woodley. But so nobody expected it to be because Woodley was washed up. They more thought of it as just uh, the Nigerian nightmare. Usman was just that good that he made Woodley look bad. But then we found out, okay, so I guess Burns did the same thing. And we still gave uh, Woodley the benefit of the doubt that it was just good competition. You'll notice, even up until his last loss... People were still saying, it's the good competition. I fought these guys, they're the best. Yeah, but you didn't hold a good account for yourself. 
you got finished inside the distance by Kobe and it wasn't like a back and it wasn't a split decision it wasn't a 30 to 29 you didn't win a single round five rounds fights three round fights you got dominated from start to finish so it's not about losing yeah I agree he did lose to high competition high level but He's supposed to be high level too. So not only should he not still be losing, he should be able to beat some high level guys once in a while. And he didn't do that, but at least show some uh, success in those fights. Show us that you've been training hard, that you're working, because that's what's gonna tell. That's why you gotta ask yourselves, when there's somebody who's inactive, hint, hint, Conor McGregor and Dustin, ask yourself, who's the guy working harder? Who's the guy that's running with three or four guys? And who's the guy that's bicycling? Bicycling is a good cardio work, don't get me wrong. For a housewife, for a mechanic, not a fighter, you don't need to be. He counts his bicycle rides as a workout. While we see Dustin running like up hills and running with fighters. We saw him with Saba Homasi, I think, and uh, his coach. They were jogging and running. Take it from somebody who used to be an athlete. Bicycling will not help your stamina, will not help your endurance, and we even saw him gas out. One thing I noticed about Connor, pay attention, did you see that black guy he got? That just shows that even in his training against guys who are not UFC fighters probably, they're guys that are just bums that put they put him in the ring with to, you know, just spar with a guy who can, you know, keep you uh keep you loose and and uh moving so that you're not going into the cage um tense or rusty so these people are hurting connor we've never seen connor with a black eye and he used to train against good fighters and sparring with some of the best boxers and he, we've never seen him touched up like that now even in his training he's getting beat up goes to show like he's not with all that money all that fame all that success he's not uh putting the work in and he he called he said it himself i have been inactive and Dustin hasn't been. He's been more active. And that's the difference between, you know, his success and mine's. What does that tell you? If somebody's more active, they're working harder. There's training more. So that's going to show in the ring. You cannot, you can put on a show all you want. You can say everything you want. You can brag about your past. You can look back at all your accomplishments. But if you stop doing the things that you were doing before you got those achievements, You'll never continue to replicate and continue to have the same success or results. His results are no longer the same anymore. He's not getting those finishes. He's not, you know, lasting as long. He's not doing things because the res the results are different when your um, <clears throat> methods of training have changed as well so if he's not training as hard if he's not doing all the same things in his training that he used to do before he became the guy he is he should he will not get the same results either um, if you notice that uh just go back to my i encourage you guys to go back to my breakdown with dustin poirier uh second fight in the rematch versus dustin and uh and uh connor Go back to the breakdown video. I made some key points, some valid factual points and observations that nobody else has ever talked about that are still going to be relevant in this fight. There's some things that I said about the comparison between Dustin and Connor that are still going to be factors in this next fight. I made a specific comment, especially in regards to the difference between why Connor wasn't able to take some punches and Dustin was able to take them better and still give them. I, I made some points that you should probably go back and uh, listen to that are not that'll help you uh, understand what should happen in the third trilogy fight. I also even predicted if you look I have a timestamp up 32 minutes into the video I told everybody that Dustin's a slow starter if you if he's out of the first round if he didn't get finished in the first round he'll probably be a big underdog because Dustin's a slow starter his feel pro feeling out process takes a long time usually a whole round especially in a five round fight he takes his time um, but Connor's quite the opposite where he comes out like a 13 second TKO to Aldo's because he's a quick starter he doesn't waste any time and he, he doesn't know how to pace himself as well so I said that once my exact words if 
Dustin makes it out of the first round, you should consider live betting him. It'll probably be a plus 600, plus 700, or plus 900. Exactly as I said, all three of those. And that he'll, it'll be very dangerous for Connor, who's, you know, while we're watching him fade away, we're going to start to see Dustin pick it up. So one of them is going to be going this way, the other one's going to be going that way. And that's how, it's inevitable. That's how um, exactly it played out. And anybody who watched that breakdown video probably uh, would have made a lot of money because I told them to live bet at the end of this first round. If they see him at a big underdog price, plus 600 or something like that, that they should live bet on Dustin to win. So that hopefully some people were able to catch that and they, and they made some money. But this is not necessarily the same fight. So I will do a breakdown video, a more thorough exact explanation of what I think is going to happen this time based off what I learned from watching both of them training. So uh, there's two more segments I'll be releasing for the YouTube family. You can stay uh, alert by hitting the bell notification. The bell reminders will uh, notify you so you can beat the line movements and uh, hurry up and get the win loser draw smarter pick for the two more fights I'm going to break down on the channel. One of them will be the main event, which is what I always do every week. Mm -hmm. And then one more that uh, I haven't decided which one I'll break down yet. So if you want to leave some suggestions, you can leave some suggestions in the comments of which fight you guys want me to break down next. But I'm also going to have my uh, patrons vote on it. They'll let me know because if you're a $10 member and you don't get my full picks, like the higher tiers who get my full picks, I, I want to give them the chance to have a say-so in which fights I study and break down on my channel so that they can get it as well. So if you're in the Patreon, be prepared. We're going to make a vote on which fights you guys want to uh, have me break down next besides the main event. Not including the main event in the vote because that's already one I'll plan on doing anyways. Alright guys. Hope you all had a great and safe July 4th week. Remember, there's still people trying to finish all the liquor that they bought, so be careful. Make sure your loved ones are home safe at the end of the night every night because I think the Dotson get into an accident over the J July 4th. I, I assume it had to have been a car accident probably because so many crazy people doing crazy things and drinking, drunks on the road. So be careful, like, even though 4th of July is over now, the aftermath and the results can still kind of be uh, hanging around until a few more days. So be safe out there. Hope everything is okay for everybody and you guys are all safe and sound after this uh, 4th of July is over. And um, I will see you on the next breakdown segment coming up in the next couple of days, maybe a day or two from now. I'll break down the second video and the third video will be closer to maybe Thursday, Friday after the weigh-ins. All right, guys, thank you for your time. Hit the likes, please. Hit the subscribe if you haven't. Leave a comment so that helps our uh, channel grow and the algorithm for uh, me being seen. That means I'll be putting out more content. The better the channel's doing, the more content and activity you'll notice from me. And also check out the Patreon. If you're an avid better, if you're a guy who just needs to make extra income, who's not satisfied with the money that they're making or wants to give it a shot at investing with us, you won't be let down. Uh, I have a very solid system that's bulletproof that on our worst days, you're going to make your money back at least. It's it's years of of still, I still until this day, find little things to add to it or change to make it even better. So if you join now, you're going to reap way more better benefits and profits than three, four or five months ago. Like the system is working at its best on all cylinders because by trial and error, like anything else, the longer you do it, the better you get at it. And I'm at the point of almost perfection. Like I can't imagine ever not making at least our money back. But when we profit, like this most recent event, I go look at my social media. I had like 17, um, I, like all almost all of our parlays cashed in on my my most important column, it's called column A. That's where most of our money goes. We got like 17 parlays in there and like 14 of them, 13 of them uh, cashed in. So that, and mind you, these are all plus 300 and higher odds. 
So we had like plus 400, plus 300, plus 500. There were no parlays smaller than that. That was a lower parlays, like minus 200 was the lowest. And we cashed in at like an 80% accuracy we only had one pick not cashed in and that affected like three or four parlays the rest of them all cashed in and that one pick was a cheat they cheated us out of a draw uh, barcelos had got a 10-8 round and that's why one judge gave him the draw, draw but the other two didn't there, if that wasn't a 10-8 round there's no such thing as a 10-8 round the guy had him finish twice knocked him down twice so I don't know what it's a 10-8 round if you get two knockdowns and end the round on top of the guy had almost came to ground and pound finish as well. So that's like three times he almost finished the guy. If that's not a 10-8 round, what is? So they cheated us. It should have been perfect 100% results. And that was the worst version of Rione, uh, Hione Barcelos we've ever seen. He's never gassed out in any of his fights. He's never been uh, hesitant to close the distance and counter after um, what his opponent's strikes were. He's always countered after, and when he noticed his opponent hurt, he's always sensed that and went in for the kill. And this fight, he didn't do any of those things. I don't know if it was a bad weight cut or what, but he still did enough to get a draw. One of the judges gave him the draw, and that was the judge that scored it correct. Because it was a 10-8 round, only three rounds. How can you say it wasn't a draw? He didn't ever, he didn't get 10 8 He never got knocked down. So we got cheated. It should have been 100% par that night. Even though we made a killing, we had made, we've made about five times back our money. If you did all the bets that I gave you, you made a killing. Should have been way more than that. The difference between how much we made in profit and how much we would have made if they didn't cheat us out of the Barcelos or Andre Feely. That was a tier one, level one pick. That means Feely was one of my most confident picks of the night. So I used him in a slot of parlays. They gave us a no contest draw, a push. Basically, they didn't give us credit for a guy who would have made the difference of thousands of dollars for us in profits if they had given us credit for the win, which they should have because the guy was it from. Sorry about the interruption and the technical difficulties we had a second ago. It's going to skip, so I apologize. Uh, but back to my point. Uh, yeah, we were uh, robbed of a couple of uh, extra profits that we should have had on, but it would have been a perfect night had they given us the draw. And credit for Andre Feely, who was an important uh, part of our night. Tier 1 picks are the most used picks of the night. We uh, are very... Um, sway is it's a huge swing we are very affected by anybody who was a tier one pick that does not cash in means even though we got a draw or a push because of the eye, eye poke it was a no contest so we didn't lose the parlays those parlays is a there's a ton of them that had feely in them that would have cashed in for much larger payouts than they did so you know when you're dealing with plus 800 plus 900 four leggers five leggers six leggers one important pick like that could make a huge difference in the night so uh we made the good thing is i can't complain we made a killing but it should have been a higher amount of total profit so i'm a little upset about that but we'll we'll make it up for it we'll make up for it in the next upcoming event uh, I want to also let you guys know I'll do a special. I'm so confident in my bulletproof system. These adjustments, it took like by trial and error, like anything else, you just keep getting better and better. But I've designed it and I'm not going to venture off and do different things like I've done sometimes in the past. I got greedy because I was so confident. I didn't include the section of the parlays, I mean of the uh, bet slips that was the section used to insure our money so that there are safer bets that we made that would have resulted in no matter what happens with the rest of the bets we would at least break even so now that section that column alone will make sure that 
we cannot lose our money. Worse comes to worse if we went through a crazy night where we had terrible picks or none of our picks went the way we expected. We can at least depend on um, the first column to insure us. One second, guys. Okay, so back on track. Uh, yeah, so that'll help um, make sure. So now I'm so confident in my system that um, anybody who starts and joins my Patreon today uh, is going to get a money back guarantee. I'll keep it um, for the next, uh, we'll keep it for the next, let's see, what's today? If you join before the next event on Friday, you get a money back guarantee that if we don't profit on the next event or the one after, the next two events, the 17th and the 24th, or the 10th and the 7th, if we don't hit profits when you duplicate my slips and do the instructions that I give on the slips in the post, I leave instructions to very clear use. You, you, nobody would be confused by it. It's very, uh, it's very um, self self explanatory. Like if I have three columns A, B, and C, and I'll spe specify for each bet how much you're supposed to use out of your bankroll, your percentage of your money, total money. I'll have designed it to tell you exactly how much to use. So. Excuse me a second. All right, so uh, f for any reason, this next event or the one after both don't generate profits. So we got to, if you start with 500 in total and you make the bets exactly how I gave you them to make, which are usually on average three to five times money back returned, you start with 300 or you start with 500, you'll make 1500 in profit on average. That's how our good events, our good, uh, our parlays and bet slips, my total bet slips typically generate when we have good winning nights on average three to five times return back of your total amount. So if we don't, I'm not going to specify a specific amount. I'm just going to say if we profit, as long as we profit, then uh, you made your money back for your membership. It was a free membership anyways. It pays itself off. But if you don't profit, if my bet slips are losing bet slips, you duplicated them and you didn't generate some profits, then you also have nothing to lose because I'll generate, I mean, I'll give you a full money back guarantee for the bet slips for UFC 6264 and the following week after that. I think it's the Makachev card. Good card as well. I actually like the next card as far as a betting perspective from the better perspective. The next card is full of great value. We have a lot of people we can depend on. A lot of mismatches. A lot of good value. So that's a better uh, perfect card on the 17th. This one is more for the fans than the betters because, again, they made it very competitive, close to fight. So you got to be careful of how you bet this event because you will not make money if you do it the ordinary way where we are typically used to making parlays. It's got to be designed specially. The, the percentage of your money has got to be specifically uh, dispersed the proper way or you will get eaten alive they will take you for everything you got so join the patreon you got a money back guarantee offer special offer on the table for a limited time only you have nothing to lose there's also entertainment pro, um, posts so it's a fun community we all get to talk about current of mma uh topics that are uh in the news and stuff so i make those news posts future fight announcements live betting tips in the middle of the event i'll tell you when what it when and what is going on so you can make some money live betting i also do outside mma sports the nba nhl nfl soccer every sport almost that's lucrative i can um i include it for the patrons and we've been on fire with those plays huge profits every week 
middays, so it's almost every day. It is every day, exception. Sometimes I may miss like one day of the week, but five or six days at least, I do uh, outside MMA bet uh, picks and parlays so that you can build up your bankroll for fight week. You have a larger amount of money you can invest to bring in more profit. So money making money, and we're using their money. After a, a few weeks of being with me, you'll notice that now you're just profits is making more profits. You're not even using your own money any longer. All right, guys, thank you for your time. Hit the like, hit the subscribe, the notification reminder so you can get my picks early before the lines move uh, away and you lose value. Hit the bell notification, subscribe if you haven't, and please leave a comment. It helps us out. And also, um, you can leave some suggestions of which other fight you would like me to break down for UFC 264. I'll be back again for the main event as well. Thank you, guys. Talk to you all soon.